and welcome to Insight Ophthalmology. This is Dr. Amrit and I welcome you to another lecture on optic nerve. Today we are studying the ischemic optic neuropathy. Under the heading of ischemic optic neuropathy, we will be studying the AION that is the anterior ischemic optic neuropathy and PION that is the posterior ischemic optic neuropathy. In order to understand the ischemic optic neuropathy and the AION and the PION, the anatomy of the optic nerve is very important. As I already told you in my previous lecture on the anatomy of the optic nerve, the optic nerve is divided into four parts and the first part of which, which is the optic nerve head is actually again divided into four parts that is the superficial nerve fiber layer, the prelaminar region, the lamina cribrosa region and the retrolaminar region. Now again each part of the optic nerve head is having a different blood supply. The surface nerve fiber layer is getting its blood supply mainly from the, from the central retinal artery branches and the prelaminar region, lamina cribrosa region that is the laminar region is getting its blood supply from this artery over here which is nothing but the posterior ciliary arteries, right? So, having a knowledge about the blood supply of the optic nerve is very important and if you're not very thorough about it, I would suggest you to visit my video on my channel on the blood supply of optic nerve. Similarly, the posterior part or the retrolaminar part and also the intraorbital part of the optic nerve, okay, its blood supply is also very important. As you can see, it is the central retinal artery which is actually um, traveling within the substance of the optic nerve which is going to supply most of the intraorbital part of the optic nerve. Along with it, this is pile plexus which are nothing but the uh, the small small arteries which are coming from the pia matter which is surrounding the optic nerve. Now what are the various types of ischemic optic neuropathy? The ischemic optic neuropathy is basically two types anterior ischemic optic neuropathy and the posterior ischemic optic neuropathy. The ischemic optic neuropathy of the prelaminar region and the laminar region of the optic nerve head is referred to as the anterior ischemic optic neuropathy. Whereas, whenever we have ischemia of the intraorbital part of the optic nerve, it is called the posterior ischemic optic neuropathy. Now, if you have any doubt regarding the parts of the optic nerve, I would suggest that you uh, revise my video on the anatomy of the optic nerve. Coming to the anterior ischemic optic neuropathy. As I already told you, it is because of the interference with the blood supply of the posterior ciliary artery to the anterior part of the optic nerve, mainly the prelaminar and the laminar portion, right? And why is it so? Because the posterior ciliary arteries will go and supply the prelaminar and the laminar portion of the optic nerve head and they're also going to form this uh, circle, uh, the Haller and Zinn circle around the optic nerve head, right? So any uh, compromise with the blood supply of these posterior ciliary arteries to the region will lead to anterior ischemic optic neuropathy. Now, one more thing that you should remember is here the central retinal artery will not be involved right because when the central retinal artery will be involved i told you that the intraorbital portion of the optic nerve right and mainly the retrolaminar portion of the optic nerve head that is the one which is supplied by the central retinal artery okay so specifically when central retinal artery is involved what we get is a pion that is a posterior ischemic optic neuropathy right however when the pca that is the posterior ciliary arteries are involved then what we get is a uh, infarct in the prelaminar or the laminar portion of the optic nerve head which is present anteriorly and therefore it is called anterior ischemic optic neuropathy. Now, the types of AION. Anterior ischemic optic neuropathy is again divided into two types that is the arteritic AION and the non-arteritic AION, right? And how is it divided? It is divided based on the pathology or the pathophysiology. In the arteritic AION, it occurs because of the inflammation. So, there is an inflammation as the cause of the AION, then that is called arteritic AION. Okay, ITIC means actually inflammation. Now, if the AION is occurring without inflammatory cause, it is called non-arteritic AION. Also, it is written as NAAION. Okay, non-arteritic AION. Now, before I go into the details of the arteritic AION and the non-arteritic AION as separate entities, it is very important for us to know certain clinical features which are 
common to both the arteritic AION and the non-arteritic AION. Out of this, the first thing is that any ischemia for that matter in the body with certain exclusions, remember that it occurs beyond the age of 40 years, right? Now, second thing is the type of vision loss which will occur in both arteritic and non-arteritic AION or any ischemic type of AION will be a sudden vision loss. Third thing is the color vision will be affected, okay? Color vision will be affected and specifically it is the red saturation which is affected. So what I mean by red saturation is that when you show a patient a red color object, say a red ball or a red torch or any red substance, the eye which is having the optic nerve pathology will see this red color in a lighter shade compared to the other eye which is normal. Okay, so this red saturation or red desaturation test is very important specifically because it tells you that there is an optic nerve pathology. However, whenever there is a macular pathology, it is the blue color which is affected. Okay, so that is very important to remember that red saturation occurs in the optic nerve pathology. So, uh, the common features which are there to arthritic and non-arthritic is number one, age is more than 40 years. Number two, vision loss will be sudden in both of them. Number three, there will be reduced color vision. Specifically, there will be red desaturation. And number four is they will have a visual field defect. That could be either a central field defect or it could be an altitudinal field defect. Now, you might ask that why do they have an altitudinal field effect? So, in that you should remember there is that the anterior part of the uh, optic nerve, which we are referring as the optic nerve head, as I told you, it is supplied by the PCA, that is the posterior ciliary arteries. Now, these posterior ciliary arteries, they come in bunches, okay? They are coming in the bunches like this. Now, these posterior ciliary arteries, one bunch will supply one segment, the other bunch will supply other segment and suppose this bunch will supply this segment, right? So, they have a segmental supply to the optic, optic nerve head. So, whenever one segment is also damaged, I mean, what I mean to say is whenever one segment is blocked and whenever there is hyperperfusion to one part of the PCA, only one part of the optic nerve head which is supplied by that PCA will be affected, right? The other three or other segments which are supplied by the other posterior ciliary arteries will be normal, right? So, that is the advantage of having posterior ciliary arteries that there are so many posterior ciliary arteries. However, they are supplying segmentally, okay? This is uh, with difference to the central retinal artery because we have only one central retinal artery which will go and divide and supply the entire retina. Okay, so if you have a block in the central retinal artery, the entire retina will be having ischemia and that is what we call it as central retinal artery occlusion, right? However, that is not the case with the posterior ciliary artery. If one segment is involved, only that segment of the optic nerve will be actually affected, right? So what happens is that why do we get an altitudinal field defect also lies in the, the reason also lies in that explanation. So suppose this is an optic nerve and this part is supplied by PCA, some PCAs and the upper part is being supplied by the posterior ciliary arteries or the posterior ciliary arteries, right? Now, Suppose this, these posterior ciliary arteries get blocked, what happens is that this inferior part of the optic nerve will be affected, right? And if this inferior part of the optic nerve is affected, which kind of field defect we will get? We will get a superior altitudinal field defect, right? Because of the segmental involvement, because of the segmental nature of the posterior ciliary arteries, we get a segmental field defect and that is called an altitudinal field defect, right? Now, another type of field defect which can occur is central field defect. Now, sometimes what happens is, this is more common in arteritic type of AION. In arthritic type of AION, what might happen is the entire optic nerve might get involved, okay? And in that case, what happens is the entire field of vision will be lost and then we'll have a central field effect. Now, one more important thing which is common to both the arthritic and non-arthritic AION 
or to any optic neuropathy as such is that presence of a relative afferent pupillary defect right so i do have a video on uh, rapd on my channel if you want to know more uh, about it in more detail you can visit that and you can see that here this picture actually shows a superior field defect okay or also called superior altitudinal field defect and this is just again uh, a revision for you the common features of arthritic and air and non-arthritic sudden vision loss reduced color vision altitudinal or central field defect and relative afferent pupillary defect now let us talk about the types of aion in detail the first thing that we are going to discuss is the arteritic aion as the name itself suggests itic means basically inflammation so arteritic aion is actually the inflammation of the small and the medium size arteries right and what type of inflammation it is it is the granulomatous inflammation right and what happens is that there will be infiltration of the full thickness of these vessels that the small vessels and the medium size arteries will have infiltration by the lymphocytes the plasma cells the macrophages and these macrophages when they're going to collect together they're going to form multinucleated giant cells right so all these cells are going to come and infiltrate the wall and the full thickness of the vessel leading to giant cell arteritis or the arteritic aion now let us look at the histological picture over here this is a normal healthy vessel we can see that a vessel wall is actually made up of three layers the innermost layer which is the tunica intima the middle layer which is formed of the smooth muscle fibers and that is a tunica media then the outer fibrous layer or the outer coat which is called tunica adventitia right and inside shown over here is the lumen which is carrying the blood right now in giant cell arteritis you can uh, compare the thickness of these three layers we can see that the tunica intima has increased so much in thickness similarly the media also has increased and adventitia also has increased in thickness and why is that thickness increasing because there is so much infiltration of the cells right so the plasma cell lymphocytes macrophages and the giant cells are also coming and infiltrating the walls of these vessels leading to giant cell arteritis arteritis so a giant cell is nothing but it is a clumped macrophages these macrophages are actually going to come together and they're going to lose their cell walls and they will actually form a cell which has cytoplasm and will have multiple nuclei, nuclei right that's why it is called uh, multinucleated giant cells so in this normal picture we can see that in the innermost part we have the internal elastic lamina right and then we have a tunica media which is showing these regular cells these are nothing but a smooth muscle cell however in this picture you can see the intima is increased so much and it is actually infiltrated with so many cells which are shown in this blue color nuclei and this new intima is called the neo intima and in this new intima there will also be fragmentation of the inner elastic lamina so all these cells they are coming they are causing inflammation and they are also causing the fragmentation of the internal elastic lamina of the tunica intima so what is happening as i told you that this is a lumen which is carrying the blood to the organs right so it could be any target organ in this case we are talking about the optic nerve now here in giant cell arteritis because of the thickening of the three layers of the uh, wall of the artery what has happened the lumen has now decreased in size now since the lumen has decreased in size what will happen to the blood flow the blood flow will also decrease in uh, amount and what will happen there will be ischemia right so ischemia is nothing but hypo perfusion so whenever we have less blood supply to an organ it is called ischemia and when it occurs in the case of the optic nerve it is called ischemic optic neuropathy now let us talk about the clinical features of the arteritic aion now in case of the arteritic aion what did i tell you it is an inflammatory disease right so in any inflammatory disease there will be pain and therefore these people have headache specifically they have headache in the temporal region of their head right why because there we have the superficial temporal artery this superficial temporal artery usually gets affected in giant cell arteritis and it will be very tender to touch along with that even the surrounding scalp area will be very tender to touch 
Moreover, normally the superficial temporal artery, when we touch, we can actually feel our pulsations over here. But because of the thickening of the wall of the superficial temporal artery, this palpable artery will now feel non-pulsatile. We will not be able to feel the uh, blood flow through it. Probably also because of the narrowing of the lumen of the superficial temporal artery. Now, they will have headaches, they will have painful scalp and along with that they might also have pain in the muscle and joints which is called polymyalgia rheumatica. Now, because it's an inflammatory condition, they will have weight loss and also along with that fever, they will have fever because of the acute phase reactants which will rise in these patients. Along with that, they will have jaw claudication and cranial nerve palsy. Now, the reason for jaw claudication and cranial nerve palsy is also decreased blood supply. Since giant cell arthritis will affect all the small and the medium sized vessels, the nerve supply to the jaw and to the cranial nerves is also through the small and medium sized vessels. Specifically, when you talk about the cranial nerves, the nerves are supplied by something which is called the vasa nervorum. The vasa nervorum is nothing but it is a plexus of the vessels which are surrounding the nerve and supplying the nerve. And these vessels are usually smaller in their diameter. Since giant cell arthritis affects these smaller cells, smaller diameter sized vessels, even these cranial nerves will now be ischemic and there might be cranial nerve palsy because of the decreased blood supply to these cranial nerves. Right? Now, now, other uh, clinical features which are important uh, for the arthritic AION which will differentiate it specifically from non-arthritic AION is that the vision loss which occurs in this patient who is having arthritic AION will be a severe vision loss. And what, does I, what do I mean by severe vision loss is that the vision loss will be worse than 6 by 60 or 20 by 200. Okay, and usually the patients will be more than 60 years of age and females will be more affected. As we all know that the connective tissue disorders are usually more common in females and the same way arthritic AION is also more common in case of females. So whenever you have an elderly female who is coming with an optic disc edema and you're suspecting AION and she's having uh, jaw claudication and weight loss, scalp tenderness, headaches, you know, pain is a predominant feature. You have to think about the arthritic type of AION. Now, why it is such a dangerous type of AION is that because the fellow eye will get affected in about 95% of the patients within days to weeks. So, what I mean to say is if one eye actually gets affected with giant cell arthritis, the other eye has a probability of getting affected in 95% of the cases and that too it will get affected very fast, right? Within days, sometimes within hours also the other side will get affected. Now let us uh, come to the pathophysiology of non-arteritic AION, right? So in arteritic AION, we know that it is the inflammation which is at fault, that is the giant cell arteritis and that is causing the arteritic AION. But in non-arteritic AION, the main uh, cause is actually the hypoperfusion of the disc because of non-inflammatory causes, right? So what are the reasons that there might be hyperperfusion or decreased blood supply to the disc? Either it could be because of the decreased blood pressure, that is hypotension, or it could be some reason that the dissolved oxygen in the blood is less, which is called hypooxygenation, right? So what happens is that the blood supply of the optic nerve depends upon the perfusion pressure. Perfusion is nothing but the amount of blood which is going and supplying and giving nutrients to the optic nerve. So, the perfusion pressure is nothing but mean arterial blood pressure minus the intraocular pressure. That means how much blood is going to the eye. From that, we have to subtract the amount of pressure which is present inside the eye. The subtraction of that will give us the perfusion pressure. So, whenever the arterial pressure will fall, what will happen? The perfusion pressure will also fall. And whenever the IOP will rise, what will happen? Again, the perfusion pressure will fall, right? So, therefore, whenever the patient is suffering from glaucoma also, there is a risk of decreased perfusion pressure and therefore, there is a risk of non-arteritic AION.
Now there are certain anatomical causes also of the non-arthritic ion. So what I mean to say is like crowding of the disc or small disc of uh, which is small cup which is called disc at risk. So what happens is that if this is our normal uh, disc okay this is the disc and this is the cup and here is our neuroretinal rib. Now we know that all the surface nerve fiber layers are going to finally pass through the disc through the neuroretinal rib right so what happens if in a patient we do not have any cup at all what does it mean if there's a small cup it means that there is crowding there is so many there are so many nerve fiber layer or axons passing through the neuroretinal rim that they have actually pushed the cup and made it so small so that indicates that there is that there is a lot of crowding at the disc right so whenever there is crowding also there is more risk that that disc might not get adequate blood supply because the same amount of blood has to now go and supply so many axons and that too in so and the that too in such a crowded atmosphere right so that disc also will become a disc at risk and what is the risk here the risk is of non-arthritic AION so let us see some of the systemic causes of the non-arthritic AION so what did I tell you arterial nocturnal arterial hypotension right so at night in some patients there might be arterial hypotension and usually they have seen that even when we take a day nap that time also our blood pressure might fall down right so that might also be a risk factor for few to get non-arthritic AION similarly patients with sleep apnea also okay at night what will happen they will have episodes of apnea and because of that apnea apnea is nothing but cessation of respiration right so at that time what will happen their oxygen saturation will decrease and i told you that whenever there's oxygen saturation are decreasing or hypooxygenation that might also lead to non arthritic aion now other risk factor is hypertension now you might say that if mean arterial pressure is more it should lead to a better perfusion but no that is not correct over time what happens is when the chronic there's chronic hypertension okay there will be changes which occurs in the tunica media or and the intima of the blood vessel and there might be thickening of the tunica media especially that is the uh, that is our uh, musculature which is present in the blood vessel so what happens because of the thickening and contraction of the tunica media and its smooth muscle is that there might be vasoconstriction and because of that vasoconstriction the lumen of the arteries are is actually becoming narrower now because of that narrow lumen it is called attenuation okay it is actually called attenuation of the arteries this attenuation of arteries or vessels is very common in hypertension and because of that the blood supply will actually be less in case of arterial hypertension specifically in case of the uh, chronic arterial hypertension same way if a patient has malignant hypertension in that case acutely the pressure will rise so much that there will be vasoconstriction all throughout the body and that can also decrease the blood supply to the optic nerve head leading to the NAAION right yeah other thing is again diabetic mellitus in diabetic mellitus also this microangiopathy because of which again there will be ischemia right similarly ischemic heart disease okay the heart itself is not able to pump enough blood towards the optic nerve then hyperlipidemia which will in turn lead to atherosclerosis causing narrowing of the arteries leading to NAION right and then again migraine which is also associated with vasospasms and any spasms will lead to decrease in the uh, perfusion pressure decrease in the perfusion of the optic nerve and finally causing the non-arthritic AION. Now in all these examples there is no inflammation and therefore it is called non-arthritic AION. Now there are ocular risk factors also okay and the most common and the well-known ocular risk factor is the absent or small optic cup in the optic disc right and why does it occur it's basically occurring because of the crowding of the disc now have a look at this picture over here this patient is actually having you can see that the disc margins are not very clear and there is pallor of the disc inferiorly more pallor is there 
and superiorly the disc is not that pale okay superiorly actually it looks more uh, pinkish compared to the bottom one so this is actually a case of non arthritic aion right and always examine the fellow eye look at this eye over here where is the cup the cup is here and the cup is actually very small in this probably 0.1 Okay, CDR is about 0.1 or 0.2 is to 1, which is very less, right? So, whenever you have a picture of unilateral disc edema, you examine the other eye and you find out that the cup disc ratio is very small or maybe absent, almost 0, you might suspect a non-arteritic AION because the other eye is also the disc at risk, which is very common in NAION okay understood yeah the second cause is angle closure glaucoma or any other cause of raised iop i already told you that the mean art mean arterial pressure minus iop will give us the perfusion pressure so whenever the iop is rising what will happen the perfusion pressure will fall and therefore we might have any aion then whenever there is disc edema Okay, the disc edema might be because of any cause. It does not matter. But that might also lead to NAAION. Optic disc drusens. Okay, and then some people believe that cataract extraction is also associated with decreased blood supply to the disc. And therefore, it's a risk factor for the NAAION. Then, of course, defective autoregulation of the optic nerve head might also play an important role in the NAIOM. So, basically, whenever there's crowding, whenever there's absent cup, and whenever the pressure is raised, there is a risk of NAIOM. Now, let us have a look at the clinical features of the non arthritic AION. The first thing is that which differentiates it from the arthritic type of AION is that. It has equal incidence in both males and females. Now, if you would remember the arthritic AION, the females were affected more than males. However, here the males and females are equally affected. Number two, the age of a patient. Younger people have arthritic, uh, non-arthritic AION. However, in arthritic AION, we saw that the age was mostly above 60 years of age. Other thing is, there might be a sudden profound vision loss which is usually unilateral at presentation okay or sometimes it might become bilateral but mostly it is unilateral only right and in both of them arthritic and non-arthritic it will be unilateral however there is a difference in arthritic type of uh, AION I told you that the patient usually has pain Okay, he has headache. In patients with arthritic AION, there will be a previous history of amaurosis. Amaurosis is nothing but patient will have certain episodes of blackouts. Okay, and these blackouts will uh, resolve on their own. Right. So that occurs in a patient with arthritic AION. However, it is absent in a patient with non-arthritic AION. Okay, so pain is absent. There is no history of amaurosis also. Third thing is that the vision loss will be moderate, right? The all uh, the vision loss is moderate and also it is non-progressive type of vision loss. So, the arthritic AION progresses very fast. Non-arthritic will um, achieve its target damage and then from there the optic atrophy will start, right? However, the arthritic AION is more dangerous because it leads to complete blindness. The vision loss is also more. Usually, it is worse than 6 by 60. Whereas in non-arthritic, it is up to 6 by 60, right? And the fellow eye affection also is very less in case of the non-arthritic AION. Usually less than 30% only, the other eye will be affected. And that too, if it gets affected, it will be affected in certain weeks to months, okay? However, in arthritic AION, it was getting affected within weeks, it was getting affected within weeks and that to the incidence was about 95%. However, in non-arthritic, it is only 30% incidence. Now, let us talk about the clinical picture of both the arthritic AION and non-arthritic AION. In arthritic AION, usually the pallor will be more severe compared to the hyperemia, which is more common in the non-arthritic AION. So, what I mean to say is, is, is in arthritic AION, we will have edema, but the edema will look more pale. Okay. So, therefore, it is called pallid edema. Right. It is also called 
palate edema now along with that the cup in the arthritic aion will be however normal and if you will remember from previously that in non arthritic aion the cup is smaller in the fellow eye and this is called the disc at risk right yeah now another thing which is common with arthritic aion is actually the cilio retinal artery occlusion i'm sorry this is not central it is cilio retinal artery occlusion now what we know is that the cilio retinal artery is also coming from the posterior ciliary artery it's an it's an artery which is of the choroidal circulation and does not belong to the retinal circulation right like the central retinal artery right so sometimes associated cilio retinal artery occlusion is seen in a patient with arthritic aion however that is not common with the non arthritic aion what is more common with the non arthritic aion is the flame shaped hemorrhages now have a look at this picture here is the optic nerve and we can see that the optic margin disc margins are not clear that means that there is disc edema and moreover this disc edema is more pale and therefore it is pallid disc edema of the a arthritic aion whereas in this non arthritic aion patient you can see that the disc is edematous but it is more hyperemic okay more pinkish now this is a case of cilio retinal artery occlusion right so this is the part which is supplied by the cilio retinal artery and you can see that there is this cilio retinal artery which is isolated okay however look at this picture here there is cilio retinal artery this part and here there is pallid disc edema associated that means it is cilio retinal artery occlusion combined with the arthritic type of the aion right however sometimes even the central retinal vein occlusion can be associated with the arthritic type of aion that means the pathology which causes arthritic aion that is the vasculitis can go and affect these vessels also that is the cilio retinal artery and the central retinal vein also now this is the picture in which i want to show you the sectoral involvement right and this is more common in case of non arthritic aion right you can see this above part only a part of the sector of the disc is involved and the lower part you see the lower part is more reddish in color and only this superior part of the disc is involved right this is the sectoral involvement which indicates that the pca that's the posterior ciliary arteries are involved and it's more common in any aion now along with the segmental involvement what we have is luxury perfusion so over here in the disc we can see that the this part of the disc if you see is more pale compared to this part superiorly superiorly actually you are seeing more amount of blood vessels on top these are called telangiectatic blood vessels right so a segmental involvement with luxury perfusion goes in favor of any aion this is the same this is a picture of a patient with nai when you can see the there is disc edema and you, what you can see over here is all the telangiectasis cases was blood vessels and here we can see the flame shaped hemorrhages and they indicate this is an acute episode of nai when hemorrhages will indicate that it's a recent episode of nai when okay however later you can see the same patient the hemorrhages have resolved and telangiectasis vessels also have gone and now what are we seeing we are seeing a pale optic disc right because the optic atrophy has set in now this again is a similar picture second picture is not that clear but it indicates basically an acute case of any aion you can see this disc edema and there is there are certain hemorrhages however over here is also acute aion but this is the arthritic type of aion why because of the pallid disc edema okay the pallor is more than hyperemia so what are the investigations that we do in a case of ischemic optic neuropathy okay with regard to the arthritic aion the investigations are more serious and more uh, indicated and the first thing that we do is the erythrocyte sedimentation rate now we know in any inflammation the erythrocyte sedimentation rate will be increased and usually in arthritic aion it is 40 mm in the first hour okay 
Now, another thing that we do is the C-reactive protein. And the C-reactive protein and ESR together, they have a specificity of about 97%, okay, in cases of arthritic EION. So, what I mean to say is, if both the C ESR and CRP is elevated, it means that the patient, this test or the patient has 97% chances of not being negative of okay not being false negative so specificity means the ability to detect the true negative right so if a patient has esr and crp elevated both together 97 percent chances are there that you are uh, going to diagnose it correctly now the second thing what we do is a temporal artery biopsy because I told you that is the artery which is getting affected and it's tender and moreover it's, it's very accessible. So we can do a biopsy and in that biopsy what will be found? We will find giant cell granulomatous vasculitis involving all the codes of the vessel wall. Now, another thing what we do is the fluorescent angiography and fluorescent angiography will show the disc involvement and the choroidal involvement also, right? So, as I told you, the cause in arthritic EION is more distal, uh, sorry, is more proximal, right? So, your choroidal filling will be affected and the disc filling will also be affected. So, that is the reason we were getting even celioretinal artery infarcts, we were getting CRVOs. So, right from the uh, uh, proximal part to the distal part of the PCA, all of those things can get, get affected and therefore the choroidal ischemia is also there, disc ischemia is there and therefore choroidal filling time is increased, disc filling is also delayed. However, in case of non-arthritic EION, we do not, do not usually do an ESR or a C-reactive protein nor do we go for the temporal artery biopsy, there is no rule. However, to differentiate between the two, we can do a fluorescent angiography and in a non-arthritic AION, the disc filling delay will be there. However, the fluorescent will usually be, sorry, the choroidal filling will usually be normal. Now, coming in detail about the temporal artery biopsy, the confirmation of diagnosis of temporal arthritis is usually done by a superficial temporal artery biopsy. Okay, and uh, usually the positive findings will be the thickening of the intima, tunica intima, and the internal limiting uh, lamina, the membrane of the tunica intima, will actually undergo fragmentation, right? And moreover, there will be chronic inflammatory infiltrates which will be present. These might be the giant cells, the macrophages, and the plasma cells, right? However, if you get a negative biopsy and your suspicion is very uh, serious I mean you are very sure of the diagnosis but the biopsy comes negative then also it does not rule out arthritis because what happens is that if this is our blood vessel the giant cell arthritis might affect only this part and then this part and then this part okay so it kind of have the skip lesions okay so it has the skip lesions and it might not affect the entire course of the artery right so because of this discontinuous arterial involvement it's quite a possibility that you might get a negative biopsy. So what I mean to say is if you take biopsy from this part of the vessels, you will get a negative biopsy. But that does not mean the patient does not have giant cell arthritis. So in that case, if there's a strong suspicion, you can repeat the biopsy or maybe you can go for the contralateral side of the temporal artery also. also right? You can take a biopsy from the contralateral or the other side uh, temporal artery also. Right? Because 3 to 5 percent false negative error rate is present. So, this is the same picture. You can see the tunica intima is thickened, and moreover, the internal elastic lamina is fragmented. And you can see so many cells which are coming in the intima, and these are the chronic inflammatory cells, especially the giant. Now, finally, let us see how do we manage a case of arthritic AION. Okay, now, number one thing is that if giant cell arthritis is suspected, there is a grave, grave danger to the fellow eye. And I told you that almost about 95% is the risk that the fellow eye might also get affected. And that too, within hours or days, you don't have to wait for months or weeks. It can happen within hours. And therefore, it is always an ophthalmic emergency. And what is the treatment? The treatment is for the inflammation. So we will start the corticosteroid therapy. The intravenous loading dose of either hydrocortisone, that is 200 mg stat, or what we can do is we can give a 500 mg methylprednisolone intravenous and that will be given slowly over a one hour period. 
and after this pulse therapy we will uh, give a high dose of oral methylprednisolone which is about 1 mg per kg per day okay and then this will be given for first week right and then after that we can monitor our dose based on the esr once the esr starts falling we can taper this dose from the 1 mg per kg body weight right however even after the arthritic aion has resolved you have to give the patient a maintenance dose of about 5 to 15 mg and that has to be continued for at least 6 to 12 months now, not everyone can actually tolerate the sp uh, steroids. Steroids might not work for everyone. So, we need certain steroid sparing agents and uh, such an agent which is actually approved by FDA specifically for treatment of giant cell arthritis is the tocilizumab. The tocilizumab is a monoclonal antibody humanized for the treatment of AION. It works by binding with the alpha chain on the human interleukin-6 receptor. Okay, so this receptor is important for the signaling and uh, for the acute phase reaction, right? Acute phase reactions are nothing but which will increase the inflammation. So once it binds to the alpha chain of that interleukin-6 receptor, it will downregulate the acute phase reaction, bring down the inflammation. So it has received FDA approval in 2017 specifically for the treatment of giant cell arthritis. Now, next is the management of NAION, right? The non arthritic AION. Now, the non arthritic AION, to tell you, there is no clinical proven treatment for non arthritic AION, right? They tried oral corticosteroids, but there was no benefit. Then they tried giving hyperbaric oxygen, but that also did not show promising results. Then they gave a theory of optic nerve sheath fenestration, saying that if we fenestrate the optic nerve sheath, the subpile pressure will decrease, the subdural pressure will decrease and therefore the optic nerve will be better, it will be able to breathe better <laughs> under less pressure. However, that also failed. Then again, neuroprotective agents and even aspirins uh, is being tried. However, that is also not showing promising result for NAEION. Now, the next entity is the posterior ischemic optic neuropathy. Posterior ischemic optic neuropathy is ischemia of the intraorbital part of the optic nerve. That is the part which is present in the uh, orbit. Now, as you can see, it is supplied by the ophthalmic artery. And from the ophthalmic artery, we have this the central retinal artery, which is giving the centrifugal branches and the pile plexus, which are giving the centripetal branches right so these are the small small branches which are actually supplying the intraorbital part of the optic nerve so wh whichever disorders will affect these small pile vessels which are supplying this intraorbital portion of the optic nerve will lead to the posterior ischemic optic neuropathy usually vasculitis that is the giant cell arthritis can also cause posterior uh, ischemic optic neuropathy along with that one more reason is the systemic lupus erythematosus right and similarly any acute systemic hypotension or shock also can lead to this pion now in this case since the pathology is posterior you do not see much changes in the disc itself however in chronic cases you might see optic atrophy but in the acute phase you will not see any disc edema you will not see any hemorrhages you might just see an rapd now, another last entity is the shock optic neuropathy. So, shock optic neuropathy occurs, as the name suggests, in systemic shock or in any sudden hypotensive case. That sudden hypotensive situation might be a sudden loss of blood, trauma, maybe, okay, or maybe the patient had uh, any road traffic accident or maybe the patient had delivery and in that there was a postpartum hemorrhage, okay. So, that would lead to a sudden hypotensive crisis leading to systemic shock. And specifically, if it occurs in elderly patients who already have a compromised circulation, there might be more chances of hyperperfusion of the disc. Okay, so a patient will come with blurred vision and a field effect usually when the patient is recovering from systemic illness. So, this history is like a patient has trauma, he has acute blood loss, a patient has PPH, he has acute blood loss. But that time, because the patient will usually be unconscious most of the time in ICU, we might not notice the vision problem, right? However, later on, as he's recovering, he recognizes that his vision is now getting blurred. He's developing a field effect. Why? Because he has developed optic neuropathy because of that sudden hypotensive crisis. 
Now, in such cases, usually the disc will not show any changes. However, if if it does show in some few cases, it might show edema and disc hemorrhages. The visual field defects also will be the same, like the altitudinal field loss. And whatever damage has occurred, it is permanent. It cannot be reversed, right? In later stages, patient might have pallor. It might even look like cupping, and it can actually mimic glaucoma. So it's very important to know about this condition and take a proper history. Otherwise, the patient will unreasonably be diagnosed as glaucoma glaucomatous patient and might be even started on anti-glaucomatous drugs, okay, which have side effects. So this was about the uh, ischemic optic neuropathy. I hope that was useful for you. If it was, kindly share the knowledge. Thank you and have a nice day.